Hello and welcome to this webinar discussion on the topic of how the technology we have today can avert the climate crisis and clean our air. I'm Jeff Bernstein, the Director of Programming at Explore Booksellers Bookstore in Aspen, Colorado. We are an independent bookstore that has been located in Aspen since 1978. Explore and Environment America Research and Policy Center are co-hosting this webinar today. We are delighted to have author and scientist, Stanford professor, Dr. Mark Jacobson here with us today to talk about his new book, No Miracles Needed, How Today's Technology Can Save Our Climate and Clean Our Air. He will be interviewed by Environment America's senior director on its campaign for 100% renewable energy, Johanna Newman. Johanna will be introducing Dr. Jacobson. For those who may not be aware, Explore Booksellers Bookstore is owned by a nonprofit organization that is part of the Public Interest Network. Environment America is also an organization within the Public Interest Network. The network operates and supports organizations committed to a shared vision of a better world and a strategic approach to social change. If you buy your books at the bookstore, your purchase not only supports a small yet eclectic and inviting independent bookstore here in Aspen, but it also indirectly helps to support some of the good work that Johanna and her team at Environment America are doing. As mentioned, Professor Jacobson's book is available at Explore and can be ordered online and delivered to you anywhere in the US. We are also giving away copies of his book to three lucky webinar registrants today who will be notified by email this evening. A complete library of books can be ordered online at our website, www.explorebooksellers.com which can be delivered directly to your home. For those of you in the Roaring Fork Valley, you can order online and either have books delivered or pick them up at the store, or you can come on in and browse our selection. And with that, I give you Johanna Newman, Senior Director of Environment America's Campaign for 100% Renewable Energy. Johanna? Awesome, thanks so much, Jeff. It is so great to be here and I'm really looking forward to today's conversation. So one of the reasons why I love working on our campaign for 100% renewable energy is that it is just wildly hopeful. America has tremendous renewable energy potential. We could power our society many times over with renewable energy sources like the rays of the sun and the power of the wind. And although we still have a long ways to go on the road to 100% renewable energy, we are making progress with every heat pump and solar panel and wind turbine that gets installed in America. And so from my perspective, it is incumbent upon us and everyone who supports this vision to work to accelerate the progress so that we get to 100% renewable energy as quickly as possible, which will deliver benefits of cleaner air and a more livable climate for our kids and future generations. And in the academic world, Few people have made a bigger impact to build the science and the confidence around getting to 100% renewable energy than Dr. Mark Jacobson. Mark is the director of the Atmosphere and Energy Program at Stanford University, where he's been on the faculty for nearly 30 years. Throughout his career, Mark has focused on better understanding air pollution and global warming problems and developing the large-scale clean renewable energy solutions to address them. He's authored seven textbooks, more than 175 peer-reviewed journal articles, and is recognized globally as one of the drivers in this movement for 100% renewable energy. Um, I had a great time reading his most recent book, No Miracles Needed, How Today's Technology Can Save Our Climate and Clean Our Air, and that is really the topic of our discussion today. So, Mark, um, thrilled to have you here. Thank you for joining us. Well, um, yeah, yeah I know you have some slides prepared, but um, I guess I'll just start off with one quick question. You know, in your book, you you give an overview of how you got started on the quest to 100% clean, green, renewable energy. And a lot has changed since you first embarked on that journey. You know, when many people thought, oh, this is pie in the sky and unachievable. Yeah. I'm curious, like what recent changes have happened that make you optimistic that we'll, you know, really be able to make the shift? Well, yeah, thanks. Um, when we first developed our first energy plan for, it was actually for the world um, back in 2009, it, you know, people thought it was pretty fanciful and high in the sky and 
there's no chance at all that we'd come close to that. Utilities thought at the time it wasn't possible to have more than 20% renewable electricity on the electric grid, let alone 100%. And our plan was actually to transition not only electricity, but also transportation, buildings and industry, all energy sectors to 100% clean renewable energy and storage. But since then, you know, as of 2017, you know, people were starting to talk that, you know, 20% was no longer, uh, we'd already surpassed that. And the goal was, the question was whether we can get more than 80% on the grid, even by 2017. And then it went a few years later, it went to 90, whether we can get 90% renewable energy on the grid. And now it's even the National Renewable Energy Lab says, yeah, it's feasible to get 100% renewable electricity on the grid. And, you know, maybe the last few percent might be higher cost, but still the overall electricity grid would still would still be cheaper with 100% renewables. And yeah, utilities are more utilities on board, although they're still skeptical. But the things that have changed are the costs of, Wind and solar have dropped tremendously. Uh, storage has dropped tremendously in cost. Uh, battery storage in particular, electric vehicle costs have come down. Now there are many more electric vehicle companies. Heat pumps are more popular. It's really, you know, we have 95% of the technologies we need. And it is, as you say, a question of just implementing them as fast as we can. And also not getting distracted by technologies we know are not helpful or won't work or increase pollution or increase energy insecurity and don't really help with climate very much. So it, the key is going forward is keeping our eye on the ball, focusing on things that we know work and that we can be implemented as fast as possible. So I'm, I am optimistic because I know we do have almost all the technologies we need. Great. Yeah, I mean, it is just really exciting and hopeful to see all the technologies continue to improve and become more cost effective. Can you just give us a picture of like what the U.S. will look like in 2050, let's say, or 2045? Yeah. Um, you know, like what will what will a world powered by 100 percent renewable energy look like um, from a well you know, from an average person's daily experience? Well, the first thing you'll notice is you won't notice anything because your, your quality of life will be the same or better. Um, the second thing is, and maybe that in certain cities you'll notice this, is that there won't be any air pollution from human sources. I mean, this is 100% renewable energy is not only to address climate, but to address air pollution and energy security. So we eliminate gases and particles from human emissions from energy. And those those are 90% of all air pollution problems result from energy and of anthropogenic air pollution, that is. I mean, there is natural air pollution from like dust, desert dust. There's uh, sea spray from soils. There's you know, pollen and spores and bacteria. But of human emitted air pollution, 90% is from energy. You know, the other 10% is from a combination of biomass burning, which we also want to stop. And from uh, due to permanent deforestation, but also other types of biomass burning. And so you'll notice cleaner air, healthier, will be healthier, live longer as a result on average. And uh, now the, well, things will be simple. We won't you know, be less noisy. I mean, cars that internal combustion engines won't be here anymore to create lots of noise. You know, electric vehicles are very silent. And uh, you know, even leaf blowers will be electric. They'll be less uh, burdensome in terms of noise and smell. Um, so I, our quality of life will be better and we will be healthier and carbon emissions will start to, the emissions will go down. So the levels of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere will slowly decline and it'll take a while to get down to 350 parts per million. But if we actually do uh, eliminate 80% of emissions by 2030 and 100% by 2050, which is our goal, uh, then we actually expect, and also if we reduce emissions equivalently in non-energy sectors, I mean, in terms of greenhouse gases, about 70 to 75% of emissions are from energy. So we have to address non-energy emissions as well, which include like methane from, from agriculture, from like wetlands, well, from landfills and from rice paddies, from digestive tracts of sheep and cattle, manure, also nitrous oxide emissions from fertilizer, biomass burning emissions, as I mentioned, halogen emissions. Uh, if we address those emissions together, CO2 emissions should go down, or CO2 levels in the atmosphere should decline to about 350 parts per million by 2100. 
And uh, that's if we eliminate 80% of emissions by 2030 and 100% by 2050. Yep. So, right. So transitioning to clean energy is a big part of it, but there are other steps that society is going to need to take to yes. address methane and other sources of global warming pollution. Right, right. We want to address those simultaneously, but energy is the biggest part by far. Yep. Great. Well, I know you have some slides prepared, so um, you know it'd be great if you could walk through your presentation and I might pause periodically for you know questions or anecdotes in particular, how it intersects with the campaigns that Environment America Research and Policy Center runs. So, okay. great. Do you see it says, what are the problems, why act quickly? Yep. Okay, good. Um, okay, so I'm looking at this from an air pollution a global warming and energy security point of view, there are three major problems that I've been trying to address. Uh, air pollution does cause 7 million premature deaths per year worldwide, costing the world on the order of $30 trillion per year today based on statistical cost of life and morbidity. Global warming is expected to cost on the order of 30 trillion per year by 2050. And then the third issue is energy uh, insecurity. I mean, fossil fuels will are limited resources they will run out over time and when they do that will result in social economic and political instability and that's one type of energy and security there are other types as well but these are all drastic problems that require immediate and drastic solutions so our solution has always been well let's try and electrify all energy sectors as much as possible then the four main sectors are well transportation buildings and industry in addition to electricity and so by electrifying transportation, for example, we go primarily to battery electric uh, vehicles, but also some hydrogen fuel cell vehicles uh, for long distance heavy transport, like long distance aircraft and ships. Uh, hydrogen should only be green hydrogen, which is produced from electricity, where the electricity is from wind and water and solar sources, and but not blue hydrogen or brown hydrogen, um, which maybe I'll mention a little bit later. Uh, for buildings, we want to go primarily to electric heat pumps uh, for air heating, air cooling, and uh, and water heating, and also even heat pumps for drying clothes, heat pump, pump dryers. They use one-fourth the energy as natural gas, and uh, they run on electricity. Again, wind, water, solar electricity here. Uh, there's some heating and cooling will be from district heating and cooling. Uh, you can have individual heaters and coolers in your buildings, or you can have a district heating system where you have centralized heaters and coolers. And even there, the heating and cooling would be from electric heat pumps. Um, some heating would be from geothermal heat and solar heat in the case of district heating. For industry, we'd use, we'd electrify that as well for high temperature processes uh, with existing technologies such as electric arc furnaces, induction furnaces, resistance furnaces, dielectric heaters, electron beam, beam heaters, and even heat pumps. Mm -hmm. And the electricity for industry, for buildings, and for transportation would come from wind, water, and solar. So onshore and offshore wind, solar photovoltaics on rooftops and in power plants, concentrated solar power, that's CSP, uh, geothermal electricity, which is in addition to the geothermal heat we have, uh, hydroelectricity and tidal wave power. Now we need storage with 100% renewables. Uh, we need electricity storage, heat storage, cold storage, and also um, some hydrogen storage. The types of electricity storage options we already have are concentrated solar power with storage, pumped hydroelectric, existing hydroelectric dams, batteries, flywheels, compressed air storage, gravitational storage with solid masses, and then hydrogen um, used in uh, fuel cells to regenerate electricity. Uh, that's, a, that's a form of storage for electricity as well. Uh, for buildings, we have water tank storage for both heating and cooling, ice storage for cooling, uh, underground storage in boreholes, water pits, and aquifers for heating. And in some cases, aquifers can be used for cooling as well. And also heating and building materials. These are all existing low-cost uh, heating and cooling technologies. And then Could hydrogen- Could we talk for a quick second, just going yeah, sure. to the electricity storage? Can you touch for a second on the potential to make electric vehicles and electric buses portable dynamic batteries and then even the potential for like in-home water heaters you know um, to, to essentially add flexible capacity to our energy system well yeah let's start with the water heater so water heaters if they're heat pump water heaters which use one-fourth the energy as a gas water heater and i have a heat pump water heater in my home for example you can it's like a form you can you can heat that water at any time of day or night so when the electricity price is low or when you don't have very much electricity, 
so let's say you have 100% renewables on the grid and the wind's not blowing, sun's not shining, then that's probably not the time you want to uh, heat your water heater. But uh, when there is a lot of excess wind and solar, that's when you do want to heat the water heater. And that's a form of storage. You can store that heat, it's well insulated. You can store that heat for days and use it when it's needed. So that's a way to help manage the grid is by having water tank storage. And that's that's not only in the individual buildings, but also on a large scale when you have district heating and cooling uh, water tanks, uh, you can you can heat those and cool those when you have extra solar and wind. And, uh, and so that, that's a form of electricity storage. Now, batteries and vehicles, I mean, there's, so vehicles that have batteries, the, uh, there's, a, there's a process called te a vehicle to grid where you can use uh, electricity from the batteries to actually power your home as necessary. It's still out to debate whether that's the most efficient as a, a thing to do as opposed to just have separate batteries for a building uh, where uh, just because when you're charging and discharging batteries on your on your car, that you lose some energy that way. So it's not the most efficient thing. And also the battery degrades a little faster. Uh, however, as a, sometimes it's better just to charge your car, your electric, if you have an electric car, to charge it when the electricity price is low or when there's not, when there's a lot of extra wind or solar. Uh, so if you just ideally manage the charging and the timing of the charging and discharging of your car, or mostly the charging in this case, that is more efficient than charging your car than using the battery electricity to run your house. Uh, so, but that's still out to debate. There's still um, a lot of work, scientific work being done to determine whether vehicle to grid is, is efficient as opposed to just having in-home batteries. So Got it. I'm sure if that answers the questions. Yeah, no, that's interesting. Um, I think, you know, I see a lot of, um, excitement in the media around the potential for a vehicle to grid um you know and it does seem like as the technology gets better that is something we can potentially work out so thank you for digging into that yeah there's definitely something that's still on the table and being worked at and a lot of um, a lot of scientific investigations and practical investigations are being done and experiments are being done on this subject um but back to this the wind water solar system. So these are all existing technologies in terms of storage and costs of heating, cooling technologies are low. Um, as I was gonna mention for hydrogen, so we wanna use hydrogen uh, optimally in the system. We don't wanna use it for everything. We definitely don't wanna use it for heating buildings because heat pumps are much more efficient than combustion for heating. And natural gas companies really wanna use hydrogen for heating buildings because they wanna mix the hydrogen in the natural gas pipes and basically to extend the life of natural gas uh, industry. But first of all, hydrogen is a much smaller molecule of methane, so it leaks even more than methane, which already leaks significantly from pipes. And the hydrogen, you're gonna have to burn it, so it's gonna create pollution, and it's and including NOx and HOx pollution. Uh, in addition- the NOx is nitrogen oxides, right? Which are yeah, particulates yeah, in the atmosphere that are related to health problems like heart disease and lung disease. Yep. Right. And you know, oxides of nitrogen like NO, NO2, nitrogen dioxide, and nitric oxide, they mix with other chemicals in the air to form ozone, for example. And OH, which is another product of hydrogen combustion, is a, is a chemical radical that reacts with all sorts of chemicals in the air to convert them to more harmful or reactive forms. And anyway, so it's a big hot mess still when you burn hydrogen. Uh, but heat pumps, they use one fourth the energy and they don't result in any pollution when you're in your home. Uh, some people argue, well, if, if the grid electricity is dirty, then you'll have grid, uh, you'll still have some pollution. Although it's much less because first of all, you're using one fourth the energy. So you're burning much less fuel than you would otherwise burn in your home. And plus the intake fraction of power plant exhaust is like 1 20th to 1 30th, that of either home or vehicle exhaust. So the pollution coming out of the tailpipe of your vehicle or in your home, uh, is much less toxic to you because you're breathing less of it. I mean, you're breathing, if you eliminate it, you're breathing less of it than the additional pollution from power plant, not to say we want power plant pollution, but anyway, in our system, we're going to 100% renewables and electricity as well. So ultimately everything will be uh, clean and we don't want to have combustion. That's the key is to eliminate combustion. Uh, so anyway, the, the hydrogen applications we do want, well, 
steel production. I mean, one way right now, a lot of carbon emissions come from steel and air pollution, but by replacing coke and coal for converting iron ore to pure iron, that's what's used right now at high temperatures, you can actually convert iron ore to pure iron with hydrogen. And if the hydrogen is from wind, water, solar, uh, and the electricity and the heat for per, that process is produced from wind, water, solar, then you have zero emissions from converting iron ore to iron. In fact, there's a steel factory in Sweden that's doing this right now. And the overall process of producing steel from green hydrogen is about 98% carbon free. And so this green steel plant that's in Sweden, it's so successful, they're going to con convert all the uh, steel plants in Sweden to it. And several other uh, countries in Europe are doing the same thing. So that's one application. The other is ammonia production. Ammonia is already produced from hydrogen. 96% of all hydrogen today is produced from natural gas. And we want 100% of it though to be produced from wind, water, solar. And so you're gonna produce ammonia anyway from hydrogen, so you might as well use green hydrogen. Uh, the third application is long distance heavy transport, like long distance aircraft and ships. Ideally, all transport would be electric, but when you have like long distance aircraft, it, you just end up spending a lot of energy carrying around more and more batteries. And so at some point it becomes uh, not practical, not, doesn't work. And so that's when you need hydrogen fuel cells. So it turns out you can use hydrogen fuel cells for long distance heavy transport. And so long as it's green hydrogen, that's okay. The only emissions are water vapor, and but it's less water vapor than from uh, jet fuel. And so your contrails would go down about 80% and your all your other emissions just disappear aside from water vapor from the airplanes. Mm -hmm. uh, in electric airplanes, of course, which would be all short haul flights, which are 1500 kilometers or less, which by the way, are about 84% by number of flights worldwide are short haul flights. Those would all be electric and zero emissions of anything. Interesting. Um, so really, like what you're saying here is that with existing technology, we can transition most of how everyday people use ele use energy over to electric uses. And then there might be some cases where we need to lean on hydrogen. Where that's the case, it should be hydrogen that's produced by renewables um, rather than derived from fossil fuels. Yeah, yeah. The only applications of hydrogen should be steel, ammonia, long distance transport, and then there's some grid electricity storage, uh, but batteries would be the primary grid, primary grid electricity storage. In most places, all we need is batteries, but some places get batteries combined with hydrogen fuel cells is actually uh, useful. But again, those are, it's not like a huge amounts. Um, we're talking very targeted. We do not want to use hydrogen for passenger vehicles. It's just much less efficient than battery electric vehicles. We don't want to use it uh, as I mentioned, for heating buildings, we don't want to burn it. Mm -hmm. um, so very limited applications. And we don't want what's called blue hydrogen, gray hydrogen, brown right. hydrogen, black hydrogen, uh, turquoise hydrogen, or pink hydrogen, which are either from natural gas, coal, nuclear, or, or um, uh, methane pyrolysis is another one. Um, and I'm hoping that a little bit later in our conversation, we can talk a little bit about some of the policies that have passed through Congress recently, like the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act and the Inflation Reduction Act and the various incentives that are there and how they help and how they, you know, potentially yeah, yeah up some of the false solutions. Um, but yeah, I'll, let's I'll definitely talk going. about those when we uh, at the end of this, then we'll talk about yeah what's not good and how funding can be directed to actually help solve the problems and not delay the solutions. And then I will say we will have time at the end of uh, today's conversation uh, to take some questions and answers. So um, on the Zoom platform in the bottom of your uh, screen, you should see a Q&A uh, button. If you have questions, uh, please enter them there and we'll we'll get to them at the end. Okay. Okay, great. Well, let me just move on. So let me just talk briefly. So I did electrify or build a all electric home back in 2017 and it's been working amazingly. There's no gas on the property, it has solar on the roof, has some Tesla wall mount batteries that are still operating uh, and has electric cars and so no gasoline cars, uh, electric heat pumps. This is a called a ductless mini split uh, heat pump, air heater and air conditioner. So they're inside units like on the left in each major room in the house. And then there are a couple outside units and these are connected by with tubes of coolant and heat pumps operate by moving heat around rather than creating heat. And so they use one fourth the energy as natural gas 
heaters. And Mark, can you just explain that a little bit, like the, just the idea of moving heat around? Yeah, sure. Um, well, so even at low temperatures, you can extract heat from the outside air. And this is what this is doing. This is called an air source heat pump. You can actually, well, there are three types of heat pumps. There's air source, ground source, and water source, or there could be a waste stream source, I guess, as well. But so you could, here you're extracting heat from the air. If this was a water source heat pump, you'd extra, be extracting heat from water. If it's a ground source, you're extracting heat from the soil underground. But in this case, you're basically, uh, by a combination of evaporation and condensation of a coolant, because the, there's a coolant that goes between these two, the outside and inside systems in a tube. And that coolant is at a lower boiling point than water. So it can, if you, like if it's hot inside your house and you want to cool it down, you run the coolant by the, you bring the air through this device on the left and the air is exposed to the coolant and that heat from the air heats that coolant until the coolant evaporates. And that sucks out energy from the air, cooling the air. And then the air gets, the cold air then gets sent back into the room. That evaporated coolant then is go through the, goes through a tube to the outside and through a combination of compression and pressure changes uh, and uh, recondensation, that heat that's now absorbed in the gas is re released to the air outside. And conversely, so that's how you'd cool that your room. And conversely, when you want to heat the room, you you suck heat out of the air from the outside and you move it into the inside. So it's it's a combination of evaporation, condensation, and compression and expansion that results in the transfer of heat. Right. Um, that whole idea of transferring heat rather than creating heat, I think, is um yeah, yeah, just a core thing to understand. And I will say. Uh, we did a whole webinar about that was all about heat pumps and we had heat pump installers on and um, we'll share a link to that in the chat in a little bit if folks are interested in getting more information about heat pumps and, um, you know, how federal tax credits can help you get one. Yeah, it's, no, it's a great technology. And so here's, in fact, of a water heater. It's also a heat pump water heater. Here, the heat is being exchanged with the air outside of the, in this, in this room. So the room becomes a little cooler and heat is extracted from the air to heat the water through a combination of compression and heat latent heat release due to evaporation and condensation of the coolant that's inside the, the water heater. But this, again, it uses one fourth the energy as a natural gas heater. It works perfectly. You don't need gas pipes. In fact, I saved by not having any gas pipes in my house, I saved about $10,000 of pipes. I saved another $6,000 by avoiding a, a gas hookup fee to the just the pg e my utility, want to charge $6,000 just to hook up the gas from the curb to two inches from the curb. <laughs> it's just a fee they charge to hook up gas. So you save a lot of money just by not having gas in your home. Uh, for cooking, I use an electric induction cooktop. This operates, well, you need pans or pots that have a stainless steel or iron base, something that's resistive. And it operates by well, an electric current runs in each of, the, when you put a pot on it with some food or water, uh, electric current runs through each of those inside one of those circles. And that current induces a magnetic field. Well, results in it. There's a magnetic field whenever you have a current, there's a magnetic field that results. And that magnetic field induces a current in the base of the pot or the pan. And that current, because the current gets dissipated by uh, the resistance, in the pot or the pan, it gets dissipated to heat. The electricity gets dissipated to heat, heats the pot or the pan and cooks the food. And as a result, the stove itself does not get hot. So if you touch the stove, even when you're boiling water, it's just warm uh, because you're only transferring heat from the pot to the stove rather than heating up the stove itself. Like when you have a gas stove, you actually heat the stove or an electric resistance stove, you're heating the stove and that then transfers the heat to the water. But in this case, so it's, it cooks evenly, it works really well, it runs on electricity, and so it's great. And I show a burner on the left, it's an individual burner you can plug into the wall. That costs between 30 and $80. And I mention that because 7 million people die every year worldwide from air pollution, about 2.4 million are from indoor burning of biofuels for home heating and cooking. And so just replacing 
burning fuel with a single induction burner that's really inexpensive, you do need an electricity source, obviously, but now we're working on microgrids to pro provide electricity and heat for villages uh, and remote villages that aren't connected to the electricity grid. So it's a way to actually solve a large air pollution problem simultaneously with providing uh, heat and electricity to communities. Um, let me just go to just summarize what, what over, well, now it's been six years, but over six years, it's the same result. 120% of all my home and vehicle energy use was provided by solar on the roof. So I had extra 20% that I sent to the grid and I have a community choice aggregation utility, um, Silicon Valley Clean Energy, and they actually pay me for that extra electricity on an average of about $860 per year. And, so, and I've had no electric bill, gas bill or gasoline bill and avoided, as I mentioned, a gas hookup fee, gas pipes are avoided. These show averages for typical homes, mm -hmm. electric bill, gas bill, gasoline bill. So you have an upfront savings plus an annual savings. And with subsidies, uh, there's still subsidies around in the federal, at the federal level and also several states. It was a five-year payback time. Without subsidies, it would be 10 years, but it's already paid itself off, the whole solar and battery system. And uh, the solar is warranted for 25 years. And so this is free energy after you paid it back. I mean, I would recommend, well, certainly any new home, but even retrofits. In 2005, I retrofitted a previous home doing the same thing. And even though the payback time is longer, still you get clean energy and you have you eliminate your fuel bills, uh, even though you have, you know, you, there's an upfront cost, obviously, to do this. But uh, it's just... If, people, we should all be doing this uh, to the extent we can. Um, obviously, not everybody can do this, but it's uh, something that future uh, buildings should all be zero emissions and have all these uh, technologies. They're just so efficient. Yeah. Huh? And that is, I mean, policy makers at the local, state, and national level are pursuing that in different forms. Um, so. Right. Um, well, let me just really briefly talk about, we've developed plans for 145 countries, all 50 U.S. states, um, over 100 cities worldwide, and these all call for 100% clean renewable energy and storage for everything. And uh, just to give you an example, well, the first benefit of a transition is when you electrify everything is you reduce your energy use significantly on the order of about 56% worldwide because of the efficiency of heat pumps, the efficiency of electric vehicles, the efficiency of electrified industry. And also most people aren't aware, but 11% of all energy worldwide is used to mine, transport and refine fossil fuels and uranium. If we go 100% wind, water, solar worldwide, you know, the wind comes right to the turbine, solar comes right to the panel. We do not need to mine for fuels. And so when we add that 11% to the other savings and plus energy efficiency improvements, we get a 56% reduction of our energy requirements worldwide. And this uh, helps to reduce the cost of energy, as I'll show you. But uh, average worldwide, this you know, we each plan for each country we developed has a different set of resources that uh, will be needed and is available in each country. But this shows the average worldwide; it would be about 32% onshore wind, 30% solar PV, about 16% rooftop PV, about 13% offshore wind, 5% hydro, which all exists by the way. That's all existing hydro. And then we're the rest is CSP, geothermal, electricity, and heat, solar heat, and some tiny amounts of wave and tidal power. So you know it's going to be wind and solar primarily on the order of 90% wind and solar. Uh, this is a U.S. mix. It's, it's a little bit different, but not a whole lot different. Um, combination of wind and solar, but also some water. And we, we consider geothermal part of water. So that's where we get wind, water, and solar. Um, but what's the capital cost? The capital cost of transitioning the world, we calculate would be about $62 trillion. And in the US, about 9 trillion, and China's about 13 trillion. So these are the Green New Deal costs of transitioning the world or individual countries. And But what's really more relevant is what's the annual cost of energy? I mean, today we pay about $11 trillion per year for energy. In 2050, that's expected to go up to about $18 trillion per year. The health costs in, in 2050 and are- BAU on this slide means business as usual. So if we just keep doing what we're doing versus the wind, water, solar scenario, right? Yeah, BAU is business as usual and projected. And that's, yeah, that's just based on traditional trajectory trajectories of 
there are some natural changes to renewables in business as usual and if energy efficiency improvements, but obviously not 100%, which is the wind, water, solar. So wind, water, solar is 100% renewable energy for all energy purposes. And when we, so we have health costs associated with business as usual, and even in 2050, climate costs are on the order of 32 trillion per year. So the total social cost is the energy plus health plus climate cost, which is 80 through $83 trillion per year. Whereas we eliminate health and climate costs from energy, these are all from energy. We eliminate health and climate costs from energy by going to wind, water, solar, and we reduce our energy demand by about 56%. And we reduce the cost per unit energy by another 15%. So that's why we go down from 17.8 trillion per year energy cost in BAU to $6.6 .6 trillion per year. And that's a 63% reduction of energy costs. Again, due to 56% reduced energy demand and 15% reduced cost per unit energy. And then- And it the looks like for people who are interested in digging in more, they can find this paper that, that dives in to the- Nitty gritty. Yeah, it has yeah. In fact, on the last slide I show, I have links to all the all the papers that Great. are relevant. Um, anyway, so ninety two percent social cost reduction. Well, so jumping to some policies, I mean, there are sixty two countries now that have committed, either through laws or policies, to go to one hundred percent renewable electricity. Now, keep in mind, electricity is only about twenty percent of all end use or final energy, and you know, then there's transportation buildings and industry, the rest. Only one country, Denmark, is committed to 100% renewables in all energy sectors. Uh, and keep in mind also, these countries, most of them are fairly small. There's some big ones like Germany and, um, and Denmark itself has a lot of emissions. But, you know, the China alone is around 30% of all world emissions. And there are another, US is right up there, pretty close. And, but there are 11 countries that are another 30%. Um, but I mean, just to put in proportion, I mean, there are 120 countries whose the sum of their emissions is, is less than China's emissions alone. So having 62 countries committed to 100% renewables is great, but it's in terms of a total emissions, it's not a, a large segment. Um, there are in the US, there are 19 states and territories that have uh, laws or executive orders to go effectively up to 100% renewables by different years. And I'll just, there are um, a bunch of countries and states that are near or above 100% electricity, electricity generated or consumed from wind, water, solar. This is wind, water, solar alone. There are the countries on the left, Iceland, Norway, Costa Rica, Paraguay, Albania, Bhutan, Nepal, Ethiopia, and Congo. They generate 100% of all their electricity today from wind, water, and solar. Uh, all, all of them are dominated by hydro and then either geothermal or wind or solar is the second most that's what those uh, h or g or w means it's hydro geothermal or wind uh, there are three kenya tajikistan and namibia that are around 91 percent wind water solar in their generation and kenya actually generates most of its electricity from geothermal and then on the right are four either states or one country effectively that is that generate at least 100% or some of them generate 100% of the electricity consumed from wind, water, solar. So South Dakota actually generates 120% of the electricity it's consumed from just wind and hydro. It's about 77% wind and the rest is hydro. Overall, it generates about 150% of its electricity that's consumed and exports the difference to other states. But it's, it's pretty cool that it actually can produce 120% of this consumed energy from wind and solar, sorry, wind and hydro. Washington state, it's about 98%. Scotland's about 91%. And Montana's about 91% of its consumption as well. Um, okay, so to summarize, well, I didn't mention jobs, but we do calculate that worldwide, we create about 28 million more long-term full-time jobs than lost. Uh, in the US, it's about three to 4 million. For land use, this uh, world wind, water, solar uh, program would take about 0.17% of world's land for footprint, mostly solar. Uh, and then 0.36 for spacing, which is onshore wind. Uh, we don't need new land for offshore wind, tidal, wave power, geothermal is pretty small. We're not adding new hydro. Uh, rooftop PV does not take up new land. So that, that footprint for land is new land that's not rooftop. Yeah. In the, the US is about a total of 0.9%, but in, in comparison, 
the fossil fuel industry occupies about 1.3% of US land area right now. So we think we're gonna reduce land requirements uh, compared with business as usual by transitioning. We'd avoid 7 million air pollution deaths per year, slow then reverse global warming. We think we can keep the grid stable throughout the world with 100%. We've done tests in every world region on grid stability. And absolute energy costs, as I mentioned, are 63% lower in climate and health and energy costs together, about 92% lower than in a business as usual case. And yeah, if you do want more information, here are some links. Um, yeah, those, I can put those in the chat as well if that makes it easier. But um, yeah, so hopefully that gave you an overview and happy to go into more detail on any of these topics. That's so great. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, yeah, sure. I'm happy I to. know Marissa has put in the chat a couple of the links to resources that Environment America has produced over the years as well, um, including our Clean Energy Homes Toolkit and information about heat pumps. But it does seem like there are a lot of questions. So um, Jeff is going to moderate our, our Q&A here. So I'll hand it back to you. Right. Thanks, Johanna. Thank you, Dr. Jacobson. So the first question comes from Stephen King, Environment California's Clean Energy Advocate. And it is this, several states like California have taken the important step of setting 100% clean energy goals and are now in the implementation phase of trying to make that happen. What are some of the best state level policies you'd recommend to make sure we reach these necessary goals? Well, the first one is to have a renewable portfolio standard in each energy sector. I mean, right now, California effectively has a, one in the electric power sector, SB100. Uh, but we need transportation. Well, there is a goal now for, I think all vehicles have to be zero emissions by 2035 through the California Resources Board, um, or it's just something like that. There's a, that. But that's effectively what we need is 100% renewable or zero emission standard uh, for vehicles, for buildings, all new buildings should be the zero emissions, which means solar on the rooftops, all, all electric heat pumps for water, air, induction, electric induction cooktops, LED lights, energy efficiency, you know, all, everything that is zero emission. So we need a standard for not only new buildings, but also to retrofit existing buildings. That's really important because there's a huge stock of existing buildings. And we need renewable portfolio standard for industry too. You know, we need to eliminate combustion in industry and go to electrification. And so I think a nice, nice thing about 100% renewable standards is you know people support going to 100% renewables, even if they don't believe in global warming. Um, in fact, there was an opinion poll a few years ago where there are 26,000 people in 13 countries and about 82% believe or supported 100% renewable energy in all these countries. And it was in the US, it was in every country that was examined, it was around 80%. But in the same countries, only 69% of the people believe global warming was an important problem. Hmm. So the interesting thing was that people believe in 100% renewables, even if they don't believe in global warming. And they actually ask questions why. And the reason is, or the, there were re several reasons. Some just believe they would just want to own their own, their own energy, uh, energy independence, uh, creating jobs, reducing air pollution, uh, energy security, it was, it you know, just made people feel better. So having a positive goal, like 100% renewable energy, that's even better than having a goal of zero carbon because zero carbon, even though it's a great goal, it's a, it's a kind of a negative thing, right? Or, or zero fossil fuels. I mean, people don't wanna eliminate fossil, some people don't wanna eliminate fossil fuels. But if you say, let's go to 100% renewables, that's like a positive thing that people can latch onto. It's like, that's why a carbon tax never works because nobody wants to, nobody likes taxes. <laughs> but 100% renewables accomplishes the exact same thing as a carbon tax, but it actually accomplishes more because you know people can get out of a carbon tax by paying it and still polluting. And a carbon tax might reduce carbon, but it's gonna increase, it could increase air pollution. Whereas 100% renewables eliminates air pollution problems, it eliminates carbon, and it provides energy security all, all together. This is why we wanna focus on things that people can latch onto and positive things uh, rather than kind of negative things that, you know, historically just don't work. Uh-huh. Johanna, did you want to add to that? 
I think the standards make a huge difference. So certainly our C4 organization, Environment America, has worked in states all across the country to put in place renewable energy standards. We're working in a number of places around building performance standards, which is how you get at transitioning existing buildings over to clean renewable energy, um, and then have also engaged in vehicle emission standards. So yeah, it's a it's a policy that enjoys broad public support, and um, we know it works. And over time, you can ratchet up the standard. Um, and yeah, that's I mean, it's it's the it's a key policy to getting to 100 percent. OK, thanks. Uh, uh, Dr. Jacobs, you mentioned heat pump clothes dryers and water heaters. Can you recommend a good heat pump water heater? Well, uh, the one I have is from Steibel. It's a it's German, and it's uh, I was able to just order it just in 2017. I was able to order online. It got shipped to my house, and I just got a plumber to put it in. It was really simple. So that that's still Steibel is still around, and they work they work really well. I'm sure there are a lot of other good ones too. I just don't I'm not familiar which ones are good. Johan, any comment on that one? I mean, I think there are a lot of options out there on the market and the options are increasing every day. So I think the most important thing is as you're thinking about transitioning different parts of your home over to running on clean, renewable energy, find a contractor that you trust and that you like to work with, get multiple bids and then, you know, follow their recommendations on what's going to work best. I have a heat pump water heater in my basement. I love it keeps my basement dry. Um, it's not a stible. It's something else. I don't know the brand, but it's been great. Okay. Now we've had several questions on nuclear power. A uh, question about it. There's a bipartisan group of U.S. senators who proposed legislation to advance the technology. People have asked about small modular nuclear reactors. Could you comment briefly on nuclear power in general? Yeah, we, nuclear is a distraction. We want to avoid spending money on it. I mean, we know for conventional reactors, there are only two reactors being built in the U.S. and they're in Georgia, and they're on year 17 and 18 past planning, the planning phase. And they've already laid a sidewalk of cement from Miami to Seattle. And they've they cost $34 billion so far and for 2.3 gigawatts. And that's about over $15 a watt. Wind and solar are $1 a watt. So we're talking 15 times the capital cost and new wind and solar take, uh, well, six months for rooftop solar, but one year to three years for utility scale wind and solar versus 17 to 18 or 19 years uh, for new nuclear. So we're talking you know, 15 more years between planning and operation at a 15 times higher capital cost or and it costs per unit energy is around seven to eight times higher now as a result. So just on a cost and delay basis, we, we need to solve 80% of this problem by 2030, 100% by 2050. If you have a technology that's plan, you plan today and it won't be ready till 2040, that's completely useless, not helpful. And that's ignoring the weapons proliferation risk, the meltdown risk, the waste issues, the fact that you do have carbon equivalent emissions from nuclear, not only from this opportunity cost of waiting around, while you're waiting around the extra 15 years, you're emitting lots of carbon in the air, you have carbon emissions from mining and you're refining uranium, which is a very energy intensive process. You have emissions of heat directly from the nuclear power plant. You have water vapor emissions from the power plant. When you actually count all the emissions compared with wind, the emissions are nine to 37 times the carbon equivalent emissions of nuclear versus wind. So why would you want to have all these energy security risks in addition to higher costs and delays when you have cheap wind and solar today? Small modular reactors, what they're spending on, these are in the test phase, and they won't even be ready for testing until 2030. So why are we wasting money on something that won't even be around? We don't know if it'll work or not any differently from large reactors. We used to have small reactors. We went to large ones because it was cheaper. Now they're going back to more expensive, smaller reactors, and they're more modular so that you can now ship them around the world and create more weapons proliferation. So it's just more dangerous. Uh, you have the same, you have waste risks as well. And if you don't have the waste risk, then you have more weapons grade or uranium. So it's one or the other. You can't have both. Can't, it's no free lunch. And you still have to mine uranium. So you have underground uranium mining, lung cancer risks. I don't know. The whole thing is just a, a waste of money. And we need to focus on things that work and implement them as fast as possible. 
Johanna, nuclear power? Uh, totally agree with Mark. Mm -hmm. uh, we haven't solved the waste issues and there are faster, cheaper, cleaner ways that we can meet our energy needs. Um, it is unfortunate that Congress continues to subsidize nuclear energy to the tune of billions of dollars and that the industry keeps I don't know, promising like, oh, but the solution is out there just around the bend. That's what they've been saying for 40 years and it just hasn't delivered and we need to stop drinking the Kool-Aid and focus on the real solutions. All right, I think we've just got time for one more question. It's directed at uh, Johanna. Why are we not talking more about the benefits of residential solar panels with battery backup as distributed power generation that supports the local neighborhood? That's a great question. I like to think that I talk about that all the time. Um, we at Environment America have a robust Go Solar program. Um, we've done reports about the solar potential of super stores in America and the benefits that communities and the stores themselves can reap if we put solar on top of those stores. We just um, last month put out a report about the solar potential of America's warehouses and just putting solar on warehouse rooftops would meet 5% of our electricity use in the United States, just warehouses. So, um, and then I do think that there is tremendous broad public appeal for the idea of making communities more resilient in the face of extreme weather and other challenges by coupling rooftop solar with energy storage. So we're gonna continue running our campaign to ask Walmart to put solar on all viable roofs and parking lots so that we can bring those resiliency benefits to communities all across the country. Dr. Jacobson, we've got about one minute. Would you like to wrap up with the solar panels on rooftops? Well, actually, I'll just say one more thing, which is you talked about the Inflation Reduction Act. There are a lot of technologies that money's being spent on that are not useful. Small modular reactors is one, but also carbon capture, direct air capture, blue hydrogen, bioenergy, creates pollution, and land use problems, or a lot of the bioenergy, and carbon emissions are not any better than today. I don't have time to go into all those, but you know we need to focus on clean, renewable energy, not things that extend the life of the fossil fuel industry. Carbon capture, direct air capture, blue hydrogen, electrofuels, those are all technologies that will extend the life of the fossil fuel industry. They love those technologies. They're pushing them. We have to beware and not give in to temptation to allow them to keep spending money or getting subsidies for these. Uh, so we have to focus on clean renewable energy, things that work. And that, that's the only hope we really have of solving this problem in a timely manner. And the exciting thing is that we can solve it. It's just a matter of getting our policies and our practices and our focus aligned with that goal. And once we do, government and industry and the private sector and individuals will all, you know, row in that direction. And our track record is great. Like when we set these goals, we hit them ahead of schedule and they, you know, confidence and public support grows. Um, so with that, Dr. Jacobson, I'm just so grateful for your participation. Thank you for all your work. Thank you for your book. We're excited to share it with everyone. And yeah, look forward to having you on another webinar, maybe when the next state commits to 100% clean renewable energy. Well, thank you and Environment America for all the, all you guys are doing. That's uh, it's a terrific. Onward. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you very much, Johanna Newman and Dr. Mark Jacobson. On behalf of Environment America and Explore Booksellers, I'd like to thank everyone for attending today's webinar. I hope you learned something valuable, as did I, and we look forward to seeing you on future webinars. Thanks again. So long.